Andre Crawford was born on the 20th of March 1962. He was raised in Chicago by his mother after his father left the family while Crawford was very young. His mother's parental abilities were called into question on many occasions with the authorities and she was eventually prosecuted for inappropriate parenting. The two children, Andre and his sister, were often left alone for long periods of time by their mother. Accusations which she admitted to when she was questioned. And in addition to this, she was also a known drug user who would often leave her children hungry and in conditions that were considered no better than squalor. After a time of monitoring and seeing that conditions had not improved, Crawford and his sister were then taken from their mother and put into the care of the authorities. And later, they were put into a foster home. Crawford later confirmed that in this home, he was in fact subject to regular beatings, which made his childhood incredibly hard. These allegations have all been denied by his foster family and also denied by Crawford's sister, who was put into the care of the same family. They, however, paint a story of a troubled boy who in the end became addicted to hard drugs and left school before graduation because of the hold these drugs had on him. Crawford went on to enlist for the army, then later, in the early 80s, the Navy. But his drug use continued and he was found to be in trouble with the Navy on many occasions and was forced to eventually leave with a dishonourable discharge, mostly because of the drug use hindering his performance. He made his way back to Chicago, but with no home or job, he had to take residence in empty buildings or homeless shelters. He found bits of work in casual labour, but continued to use drugs and drink copious amounts of alcohol. He made friends in this line of living, and many of these friends were prostitutes and pimps, who he later was able to sleep on the sofa of their homes once friendships had been established. Still, with no means of income, Crawford took to stealing and was arrested many times for this offence, as well as drug offences between the years of 1993 and 1999. After a court case, he was given a suspended sentence for his crimes. Thinking it was a given that he would be sent to jail, Crawford counted himself lucky with the suspended sentence. This luck didn't continue, as he was again arrested, but this time it was for a different crime. It was for the sexual and physical assault on a woman. She told police how violent this man was towards women, but after being told she would have to go to court and face her drug use being up for questioning while she was given evidence against her perpetrator, she dropped the charges. This man would now go free after serving one year in Cook County Jail while awaiting his trial. During the years of 1993 and 99, women were being killed. All the women had a similar victim profile and were known prostitutes. Six of them even frequented the same house where drug and prostitution was rife, the same house where Crawford was known to spend time. On the 21st of September 1993, the body of a 37-year-old woman was found. She had been murdered. She was found in a disused building just off West 50th Place. She had been beaten over the head. Luckily for the police, some DNA was recovered from her body, but due to the fact that she was a prostitute, it was unsure how reliable this DNA could be in finding a killer, as there could be many reasons for people to explain that their DNA would be on a prostitute. Once the sample was run through the database, sadly no hit was made, so no perpetrator was found. Then in April 1994, a 24-year-old woman was found. Again, she was a prostitute, and again, she had been murdered. The two murders were very similar. She had also been found in an empty house on 5,000 block 
of South Carpenter. Some further DNA was recovered. Once they find their killer, DNA would be able to put him away for the rest of his life. A gap of over a year between the last and next murder. These dates coincided with the arrest and detention of Andre Crawford. But due to DNA not being taken from him when he was arrested and detained, the police were no nearer to finding their man. The police had set up community meetings to discuss the killings and also to make pleas to anyone with information. At one of these meetings, three different women had come forward to name Crawford as an aggressive man towards women, telling them that he could in fact be responsible for these killings. But we are yet to know the reason that this was not looked into or taken seriously as an accusation. Maybe it was due to the fact that drug addicts were the ones telling the story. Or maybe they did question people who knew Crawford, as many of his acquaintances stated that he was a nice guy, who did in fact volunteer to escort children to school through rough neighbourhoods. This was known as Operation Safe Passage. Then in 1997, on the 23rd of July, another woman was found dead. She was placed in a closet of an abandoned house on the 900 block of West 51st Street, not too far from the first name victim. Even more DNA was taken. In December 1997, another victim was found in an empty building, which was in close proximity to the other victims. She had been beaten viciously and sexually assaulted, as many of the previous victims were. All murders were looking like they were from the same person, a serial killer. Again, Crawford had been arrested for further drug charges, and again, the police had failed to take any DNA from him. Another missed opportunity to catch this callous serial killer. In 1998, three further victims were found. They were all found in empty buildings, one in South May Street, another in West 52nd Street and South Marshfield. The second 1998 victim's clothes had been removed and dumped in an alleyway not far from where she was left. The last one had been murdered a little while before she was found as her body was in a state of decomposition when it was located. She had been left in an attic, a place where the murderer thought it would not be recovered. In 1999, it wasn't any better with regards to these murders. Another three victims were found and identified, one in February, one in April, and one in June of that year, all with the same MO. Disused buildings were the safe haven for this serial killer. Maybe they were considered better, as people didn't use them very often. The victims were all named. Evandry Harris, Patricia Dunn, Rhonda King, Angel Shateen, Shakanta Langley, Sonia Brandon, Nicole Townsend, Cheryl Cross, Tommy Dennis, Cheryl Johnson and Constance Bailey all victims of this brutal man. Eventually, on the 28th of January 2000, Andre Crawford was arrested in connection with the murders. A tip-off was given to the police and they decided that this time it was worth looking into and then his DNA was taken to ensure they had the right man and it did in fact match to all of the DNA which was recovered from most of the 11 victims. A three-day confession began. Crawford told the police in detail the injuries he inflicted on these women, the places he had left them. The DNA linked him directly to seven of the 11 victims. But Crawford confessed to the others also. 
He even spoke about one woman that got away. She was named as Claudia Robinson. After a horrific ordeal, she managed to stay composed during the attack and played dead. And when Crawford left, thinking that she was dead and his work was done, she managed to escape with her life. Something he had not allowed to his earlier victims. This had happened in 1997. Maybe if she had gone to the police with the DNA he had left on her, he could have been captured before he murdered more women. Crawford even told the police that this became his job and he was addicted to killing. He was referenced saying, I'm glad I was caught because I was like a shark in a pool. A sickening quote from a man who believed he was able to make any person his next victim. One of his friends had been asked by reporters when the case was in the media if they had any clue that this serial killer was living amongst them. And one of those friends, Quincy Ray, replied, you would never expect it. This is the man who would ask if he could shovel your snow, showing that this was a man with a dangerous dual personality. The name Rhonda King was a shock to police, as they already had a confession from a serial killer named Hubert Geralds, who had claimed to have killed Rhonda. But with the DNA match, this was no longer a kill for Geralds. A trial eventually took place. This only happened in 2009 due to the suspension of the death penalty and many other judicial errors that had been made, which made Andre Crawford the longest serving person detained in Cook County Jail awaiting trial in the history of Illinois. In the courtroom, were many of the victims' families awaiting the verdict on this horrible man and his crimes so they can get some form of justice for their family members. But swiftly the trial moved on and Andre Crawford was found guilty on all charges. Defence argued the level of abuse Crawford had suffered in his life. This plea fell on deaf ears as none of this had ever been corroborated. A psychologist came forward to elaborate on Crawford's hatred for women. He stated that he felt let down by his mother and this hate was then shown as anger to all of the women he killed or attacked. One female witness told the court that Crawford was known to say that they needed to be strangled and have their heads beaten in. Something which he actually did and he was referring to all women when he said this. A guilty verdict was assured, but what wasn't assured was the sentence. A jury were told that a unanimous decision had to be made to give this man the death penalty, but two people voted against capital punishment, so a sentence of life in prison without the chance of parole was handed down to Andre Crawford. Some family members were upset with the verdict, saying, I waited 12 years for justice and this is what I get. They were hoping for Crawford to face the death penalty. Andre Crawford was then taken to the Minar Correction Centre, where he remained until 2017, where he was transferred to a prison hospital due to health complications. Then, on the 18th of March 2017, Andre Crawford died of liver cancer just two days before he was about